Okay. All right. Um, so I am going to chat with you folks today. I'm just going to record this because anytime I speak, uh, my goal in life is to eventually just actually get paid to speak. Yeah, absolutely. If we want to go for it. That's my crazy family in the background. <laughs> what you don't see is my son just jumped on uh, my wife in that picture. <laughs> All right, I need to get to your setting. Oh, it looks like it's a Mac. Yes. It's a Mac. They plugged in their Mac. It's got Monterey on it, too. It's the newest software. touch bar for the first time in my life. I've had this computer for a year. <laughs> Who knew that that little touch bar was so useful up top? Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start talking because uh, it's kind of inconsequential at this point if the other screen comes up as long as you folks yeah, can see no, it. Most of what I'm going to be saying is just is verbal content. Uh, probably one of my biggest pet peeves in public speaking as someone who's like trained as a public speaker. That's what I took my undergraduate degree in. Uh, one of my biggest pet peeves is when people just read off the screen. So I'm going to do my best to be like actually a presenter and not just like a, a human, you know, iteration of PowerPoint slides. So, <laughs> um, so I wanted to, or I was invited to talk to you guys today. Um, I'm kind of like a queer person at large and only in. And so it took me like three steps backward to figure out where I was speaking. Cause my friend Tracy was just like, Hey, can you show up at Franklinville at this time and speak about being gay? And I was like, no problem. Who am I talking to? <laughs> um, so I just want to give you guys a quick intro to who I am. So we have some sort of you know, relational capital here before I do an info dump on you. Uh, so my name is Leo WT. I am a small business owner. Uh, I'm actually a religious uh, studies, or I'm a religious professional studying to be an ordained minister through the United Church of Christ. I'm a graduate student studying queer religiosities. Um, my, hopefully I will be proceeding to PhD work in queer religiosities in rural America. Um, that's my area of, hopeful area of study and research. So that's what I do, who I am, what I think about all the time. I also am a non-binary person of transgender experience. Uh, I'll break down some terms later, but that's kind of the way that I would sum up myself really, really quickly for you folks. And I'm also, on top of being a queer person, I'm a parent to queer children. Uh, so my family is this insane blend of like biracial multifaceted queerness uh, with differing cognitive levels of ability. Um, my children are all so incredibly different across the board, but uh, three of them have been, who identify as LGBTQ and have had interactions with um, the CSE at our schools and everything like that, so that we're involved in social services through our schools. Uh, and so I've experienced that both as a queer person and as a queer parent. Also, uh, for the previous 10 years of my life before I um, went into hairdressing, what is which is what actually pays my school bills right now. Uh, but before I went into that, I was a social worker in this area. So I lived and worked in Cattaraugus and McKean counties. I was the um, housing and employment services coordinator at the YWCA in Bradford. I also worked for Cattaraugus Community Action and I did work for Chautauqua Opportunities as well, where I was the, um, the director of youth programs there. Um, and I'm actually gonna talk about some of the resources that they have uh, at the end of our presentation when I give you guys a little bit more information on local resources for LGBTQ people. It is half a slide, there's not a ton, but we are working to build some, um, some real knowledge and solidarity in our area. So I'm gonna give you guys that info once we get going. Does that sound good? Do you guys have any questions of me? Not yet. Not yet, all right. 
I highly believe that it's really mostly beneficial if we interact. So at, if at any point you have a question or a comment or a concern, uh, we allotted a, a good amount of time for that. And if you're anything like me and your brain works really, really fast on multiple cylinders, you've kind of got to ask when you think of it. So don't be afraid to ask in the middle. Um, we, I have time set aside at the end for question and answer. But if you have a question while we're going, I'm not going to be thrown off if you lob it at me in the process. Does that sound OK? Um, Literally what I do is I do two things professionally, talk and be gay. And so you can, you can really hit me up on those, on those facets. Um, so yeah, that's me in a nutshell. And I want to talk to you folks today about um, LGBTQ youth and in particular LGBTQ rural youth because there's kind of a coalescing of different factors when we talk about that. So what I want to talk about first I mentioned that I'm a non-binary person of transgender experience. Um, and so I wanted to go into just a quick lexicon of terms for you that I might use throughout our presentation. This is not all conclusive, um, and there are more that will come up. But I just kind of wanted to give you guys an info to at least how I'm using these words. Uh, the idea of queerness in general, queerness used to be an insult. It used to be a synonym for weird, but through in about the early, like late 80s to early 90s, queer became um, sort of an identity of reclamation where people were no longer say they were no longer taking it as an insult and they were taking it and turning the power back around and using it as something empowering. So queer is has to do with orientation and gender, but really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about queer or the verb queering is the dissolution of artificial binaries. I spent three semesters to synthesize that one sentence of how I would define queer, but I'm really pumped on it. So uh, when I use that term queer, it's important to know that when, when people use the term queer, um, starting as early as like the ACT UP movement in the late 80s, which was a response to the HIV uh, crisis, uh, the, the pandemic that our world did not handle, um, queer became also like a, a political identity. And like I said, it was an, a reclamation. It was a, instead of a, a negation of someone's personhood, people started to turn around into who they are. And so if you do hear queer used by a queer person, there's, they're most likely using it in a positive way. You can tell pretty quickly, tonally, whether someone's using queer in a positive or negative way. Like, you'll pick up on it real quick. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, you know, email me or text me or find me on Facebook. So, <laughs> um, first, really important dichotomy that we should discuss before we go any further is the differentiation between uh, biological sex and gender. Sex is a biological reality, uh, and gender is a set of characteristics that a person feels intrinsically, not extrinsically. The appearance of one's genitals when they are born does not necessitate any particular set of interests or actions as they grow and evolve as a person. And so it's really important that when we're having a discussion about LGBTQ youth, we understand that sex and gender are different categories. Uh, there's actually a great resource, which I should have put in here, I didn't. Rats. It's called the Gender Bread Man 2.0, and it breaks down the difference between sex, gender, gender presentation, um, uh, and sexual orientation and sexual acts. So it goes into all five of those categories because they all are inter, uh, they all are independent of each other. They can interact with each other, but they don't have to. Um, so that's a really great resource. It's, it's actually, it's a, it's a teaching tool. Like it's an educator's tool for explaining the, you know, axioms of sex, gender, orientation, all of that. Um, I can go into that a little bit more if you folks have questions, but I lines up with the partners that they choose you know or it might not visibly align if they're bisexual or pansexual hello how are you we have the presentation up on this side uh we just can get it on the other side i mean i think we can all see pretty good it's okay if it won't you're all right yeah If you want to just let it be, I think yeah. you guys are all right with it. Yeah, no, we're we're good. Good. I think we're good. Yeah, it's a Mac. Yeah, it's a Mac. That's what. 
I never say no to that option, really. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please help yourself, friend. So, sex, gender, that's where we're starting off with. Uh, a really important note about biological sex um, and gender. Gender, like I said, is not necessarily intrinsically connected to biological sex. Um, gender is a social construct. Uh, Judith Butler, who is a um, uh, late, like 60s, 70s, uh, really primary author in the world of feminism, uh, is known for the phrase gender is performative, uh, not necessarily meaning that gender doesn't exist, it means that you act out your gender. So your gender, you display your gender when you feel safe and comfortable and all of these things, which I would hope as supports within a school system we're trying to help our children feel safe and actualized so um yeah judith butler's work is great i i would probably not recommend you read it because it's a little bit like just just like trying to chew on a brick but gender is performative trust me on this one we're good to go <laughs> um the other important fact that i would really like to just point out it doesn't necessarily have to do with guidance counseling but it has to do with our understanding of the way sex functions in our society biological sex is not binary there are more sexes than just male and female um, and a great place to look for information further on that is uh, i believe it's the association of intersex people um, and they have facts and figures in regards to what it means to be intersex. One can be anatomically intersex, one can be chromosomally intersex, one can be both or, you know, neither. So in the medical community, there's currently um, three recognized genders. In the scientific community, there's 13. Um, and those have to do with different situations involving chromosomal differentiations, duplications of chromosomes, missing chromosomes, all these things. And you can be, you could be intersex and not know it until you experience complications physically at some point, or if you were to get genetic testing. So there is a web of combinations and permutations of biological sex. And if you want to get down to the real nitty gritty details of it, if your gender, if your uh, physical body is, is ambiguous at birth they measure a certain part of your erogenous zone and if it's under a certain amount of inches you're a girl and if it's over a certain amount of inches you're a boy so in that way biological sex is defined by a ruler and so it's really important when you're having a conversation with folks to realize the nuance that exists within the identities of biological sex and gender um, and that's just important on a more apologetic note, like just a creating a platform of why this conversation matters, because there are people you've met that are, would be intersex and you would not know. And there are people that are intersex and don't know because they haven't had a DNA test, but it, co it comes up later in life and you find out all of these different things. So you can be 13, at least 13 different ways of being queer in this world without ever choosing it. You know what I mean? It just as a biological impetus. And as a fun fact, there are over 20,000 queer species of animals in existence today. Thus ends my diatribe about my first semester of college. <laughs> uh, but those are just important things to know in terms of why we're having this conversation, because it's real and it's valid. And people can choose to accept it or not, but at the end of the day, the science is going to continue to progress and we can either help aid and create an environment of solidarity and support, or we can detract from that. And I would hope that we're trying to build solidarity and support into our students in a school system, especially in a public school system, especially because if you're in New York and you don't, it's illegal. And then we'll have a whole different conversation. <laughs> um, Another couple terms that I might use are out versus stealth. Um, this typically has to do with one's um, declaration of their identity or orientation. If one is out, that means they've told a certain sector of their life, their orientation and gender identity. Some people, especially youth, will be out in certain situations and not out in others. And that is referred to being stealth. I have friends that are trans males that if you met them, you would never know that they were assigned female at birth. You'd never know. And they choose to live in that manner because for them, it's either a matter of self-actualization or self-preservation because it can be incredibly dangerous to be out as a queer person, especially in um, diverse environments, let's say. Does that make sense? So if I use the terms out and stealth as antonyms, that kind of gives you a little bit of scope for that. Um, yeah. Or 
in what situations or what populations they are out to to make yeah. sure that we don't. Um, I would say that's of primary importance okay. when you're thinking of public safety. Okay. Um, to, to out a student in an environment they are not out puts them at great risk of danger from themselves or others. It is vitally important that we protect and respect our students' boundaries in terms of their level of outness or stealthness vitally important and I have some statistics about that as we go on. I also brought some stuff that will come up a little bit later in the presentation but this was provided to me by uh, Brianne Abbott from Cataraugus Community Action um, and it's from New York State and it's about gender expansive or gender inclusive schools and uh, we have some legality that I'll get into here uh, but it has to do with the FERPA Act. FERPA which I actually had to take a test on this for school too so apparently I'm getting my money's worth. <laughs> but as someone who will potentially be looking at uh, a teaching assistantship within the next year or two, I have to know what I can and cannot disclose about students' private records. And uh, gender identity orientation are protected under the FERPA Act. So we'll go into that a little bit later. But it, it, it is vitally important that you respect students' boundaries and levels of outness because they're the only ones who know the realities of their lived environments. Mm -hmm. And you could be exposing your student to very dramatic negative impacts if you don't respect their level of outness. So we'll talk about that uh, and sort of familial relationships too. Uh, I also did include in the zip file that will be sent to you a guide for parents um, who are trying to understand their, com their kids as they come out. So that's in there as well if you've had a conversation with the child or if the parents have come to you and that boundary has been discussed and agreed upon appropriately. So that'll be in there for you. I'm not going to read that in the presentation, but I'm sending home with you guys for your homework. So. Um, by non-binary, um, I identify as a non-binary person of transgender experience. That simply means that my gender and orientation exist outside the binary categorizations of male and female and masculine and feminine. So uh, it, if, if I'm gonna, if I just wanna break down my identity a little bit, uh, being non-binary, right, uh, means that I queer the boundaries between male and female and masculine and feminine, meaning biological realities and gender performances, right? I also used in that phrase that I'm a non-binary person of transgender experience. So to break that down would mean that I have engaged in a process of transitioning from the gender I was assigned at birth to how I identify now. So I can say that without ever having to tell people what my genitals were or what's on my birth certificate, because for some people that is very important that they don't disclose that information. Now for me, I don't mind telling people that I was assigned female at birth, but it's important to know that there can be nuanced ways of explaining orientation and that brings me to my last point, which is, is pronouns. And I neglected to put on there the idea of micro identities. This is something that's like crazy trending right now. And I am a queer person and a queer p parent. And I am a you know, student of queer studies on a graduate level, hoping to pursue a PhD within the next couple of months. And, and I still don't know all the micro identities. Like my friend's kids will come to me and I'm like, you're a what? <laughs> and that's not a problem. I just look it up. You know, um, and the thing about micro identities is you don't have to know everyone, um, but for someone to be able to latch onto a word that validates their existence can be the difference between wanting to live and wanting to die. And so, while some people will pull, uh, will use the politically charged. Um, you know, grenade of identity politics. First of all, that's crap <laughs> because, like, being alive isn't, isn't politics. It's just, I just exist. That's not, I mean, it is a political act, but it shouldn't be, right? But it's not identity politics to say, I am, you know, an asexual demi boy or what, whatever, whatever micro category they may use. Just look it up. I don't know them all. I'm never going to know them all, but I can always, always sit there with an open posture and ask. And that is the way to build relational rapport with your students. So pronouns and, and micro identities are kind of ever evolving things that get more and more nuanced as we go. I see that as a tool and not as a detriment. Yes. And those identities can be evolving within an individual person. So yes. they might have one identity now yeah. and then figure out that they fit more mm -hmm. into a different identity yep. and that's not and that's, that's, that's an evolution of that person. I, that's yes. really like a, a, you know, 
It's not a capitulation or anything, no. And I would expect that at the age brackets we're working with in a school district, you should expect them to change. I, my son was like a, a, a cowboy last year, straight up wore a bucket, like a 10 gallon hat to school and cowboy boots. And then the year before he was wearing sweatsuits that said dripping. Kids' identities are fluid in a numerous amount of ways. It is no different with gender and orientation. And that is, an, that is a reality that's independent of sexual activity also, it's important to know. We start formulating ideas of gender and identity from the second a child leaves the womb, depending on what color blanket we wrap them in and sometimes. And that is the way in which social constructs exist. Um, but fluidity is a thing. People are, vi I am not the same person that I was 10 years ago, thank God. 10 years ago me was like, my, 10 years ago, me was like a hard line, evangelical, cisgendered white female. Very strange. Um, like almost, I don't think I identify with any of those things anymore. Uh, but we should, we should get comfortable with fluidity because if you're honest with yourself, you've been fluid at certain points in your life, right? You might have liked spaghetti and now you like steak. Like that's a preferential choice that is fluid over the course of your lifetime. And so in the age brackets that we're going to be working with within school kids, you should expect fluidity. And I think that's a benefit because if they're expressing fluidity in their orientation and gender, it means they're progressing as a person. They're searching themselves out. Some people don't self-actualize until they're like 60s or some people, people never do. You know, people say all the time like, oh, people these kids these days with their new terms I'm like I'm sorry you're gonna die sad Chuck but like let's give these kids a chance to self-actualize that's that's the whole goal right so um, pronouns can be she her and he him those are binary pronouns my pronouns are they them because I do not subscribe to either gender or biological reality that is a binary so I use they them I'm in no way offended by he him because I'm an open book um, but for a lot of kids expressing pronouns is kind of their first step of self-actualization um, there are some neo pronouns that are just like the micro identities um, different letters different combinations just look them up use them it's helpful but it's important to remember that since the 1800s actually no since the 1600s um the oxford dictionary has recognized they them as usable as a singular pronoun if you if someone forgot their backpack and you don't know whose backpack it was you'd be like um uh who does that person you know who does uh, that person be backpack belong to oh that them over there like that's their backpack you're using it in a singular use anyways um so have fun. It's not a grammatical error. That's like people's one big hang up. And I'm like, this is your hang up and you still use the wrong your? Like, come on. <laughs> um, so another quick note that I wanted to use, which I'm sure anybody who's been trained in mental health is pretty familiar with the terminology of person-centered language. Um, I am incredibly passionate about the use of person-centered language, having worked a lot in the area of, of homelessness and um, housing insecurity. Uh, people are not homeless people. They are people experiencing homelessness. Uh, a person is not autistic, they're a person with autism, right? They are a person first and foremost, and we either grant or negate personhood by the way that we refer to people. And it's important and it matters, right? It matters. And so I try to use, um, I try to use person-centered language as a thought process whenever possible. Uh, people experiencing homelessness, uh, a, a, a gay person or a transgender person, transgender is not a noun, uh, it's an adjective. And so this person is still a person, first and foremost, with these other sets of characteristics or life experiences that they're going through. Um, so person-centered language is super important. It's been a buzzword for probably 15 years in the counseling world, but I, I would be remiss to not point it out, especially in this conversation, when we're trying to grant persons their ability to self-actualize and stabilize them in their environment so that they can achieve academically, right? Um, it's not hooked up to my computer, so I just touched the screen. So today um, I wanted to talk about kind of the queer concerns that affect um, LGBTQ youth. The situation with LGBTQ youth is multifaceted. Um, when I reference the term intersectional, I'm borrowing from the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a legal scholar uh, and current professor I believe she's at one of the Ivy League schools, but I can't remember. Um, she actually gives a fantastic TED talk on intersectionality. Uh, if you want to look it up, I would highly recommend it. It changed my entire life. And I've been using the word intersectional in conversation for over a decade. And it was just last year that I found her TED talk and learned to, where I could cite the materials from. But uh, Kimberly, and it's K-I-M-B-E-R-L-E. And then her last name is Crenshaw. And if you look up her TED talk, she's given a couple, but there's one on... Um, 
I believe it's called intersectionality. Uh, she talks about it from the perspective of uh, black womanism. And she starts out with a very, very powerful illustration, which is where she names, she's, she's names a couple names. And she starts off and she says, um, she says Mike Brown. She says, um, you know, uh, she didn't say George Floyd because it's pre-George Floyd, but Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin. And she asked people to raise their hands if they knew who those was. And everybody's hands was raised. And then she said, okay, now we're gonna go with the second set of names. And I'm, I'm proving the experiment positive by the fact that I can't remember those names. But she listed the names of four or five black women who had died because of police brutality. And she talked about how to be black and to be a woman is to be intersectionally marginalized. Because you're, instead of just standing in the middle of road waiting to be hit by one truck, you're at the intersection of two roads. So you can either be hit by racism or sexism. And she uses an analogy of black secretaries um, because there was a workplace study done that was capturing the experiences of, of women in the workplace. Um, and then there was an a study done that captured the experience of black people in the workplace. But these black women secretaries were not getting promoted. And they were missed by the studies because their intersectional identity was not taken into consideration. So that's a quick note on intersectionality um, because there is very few things in life that are not intersectional, positive or negative, right? Um, it's really important that we recognize intersectional challenges that LGBTQ youth face, particularly in an academic setting like a school, right? Um, so when we're talking about LGBTQ youth that we're going to be working with this in this area, we're talking about a trifecta of issues that are going to be impacting their, uh, not only their academic performance, but their actual just level of being alive. Because when these things fall out of whack, it's very easy to literally have, see students lose their lives. Um, so we're, dealing, we're dealing, dealing with the aspects of rural youth, LGBTQ youth, and youth experiencing mental health issues. So person-centered person language, they're just modeling it a little bit. But you have all three of these factors coming to bear on our students, in particular in this area. Now, I went to college in New York City. Um, my, my internship was at... Uh, in You know, rural LGBTQ youth, but we do need to create environments that understand the intersectional realities that our youth face. Did I lose anybody there? Does that make sense? Do you guys have any questions about it? You think I'm crazy at this point? Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. I really highly recommend the Kimberly Crenshaw video. Um, I have a podcast called Conversations where the, the tagline is uh, spiritually minded conversations about life, belief, and the intersection of the two. So it really gives me a broad scope to just throw out Hail Marys and see whoever I can to come on. Um, and I've had a couple of pretty famous people, a couple of former presidential candidates. I did email the Obamas that have her back. But I, my last email I shot out was to Kimberly Crenshaw. So fingers crossed. I have no hopes. But fingers crossed she'll be on my podcast soon. So. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to start with some information for you folks from uh, a place called the LGBTQ Rural Map. Um, I included the most recent version of the LGBTQ Rural Map in the zip file that I'm sending out to you. But I wanted to give, um, I wanted to use a couple of the infographs that they provided. I can't take credit for them. But these are a couple of infographs that they give just for us to discuss the realities that affect LGBTQ people in rural America. And I'm a big proponent of the saying, I swear to God, it's mine. If anyone takes it, we're gonna have problems. But rural America is America, right? I love urban America. I love New York City and I miss it so much. But the reality is I was raised, I was cultured, I was socialized in a rural environment. I have lived, I've moved 33 times in my life, but it's all been in very similar demographic areas. If anything, I've only moved more Southern, which is like, <laughs> but, um, I've lived prim my life primarily as a queer rural American, even before I knew it, because I was in a glass closet and I was the only person that knew I wasn't straight. I'm so angry that I was the last person to know, but I digress. Um, but the stats here on rural America are really important to realize because this is the first 
really cross-sectional study that's compiled data in regards to LGBTQ rural people. Um, so we start to see the bringing together of those two intersectional identities in that study. Um, just as a note going forward, anything that's not cited in the PowerPoint uh, as we go forward today is from the LGBTQ rural map. I realized that I hadn't cite, I had cited everything else but those. So if you don't see a citation, it's from this study. And then if you see the citation, uh, it's from another study, but all of them are included in that zip file for you. So um, when we're talking about rural America, there are between 2.9 and 3.8 million LGBTQ rural, rural Americans. That's a massive population of rural Americans that are LGBTQ. And those intersectional identities mean that like we're here and we're queer, even though it's rural America. So we need to start thinking about the concerns and considerations of influences that will affect rural LGBTQ people. Um, of note, it's really sociologically important to strike back against a narrative that you have to be urban to be queer. Uh, especially in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s with, with the Castro, uh, with the village in New York City, uh, with all of these other neighborhoods, Boys Town in Chicago, we see a narrative that you have to come out and leave rural America to be queer. Because there is, there is, uh, there is a, a negation of your identity almost if you stay in rural America. Well, I never pictured myself being the poster child for rural America. Here we are. You don't have to leave rural America to be queer because there are many great things about living in rural America. And typically what you find, um, I've, I've begun um, a study of queer religiosities in rural America. So I've been interviewing particularly high school students and college students about the intersection of their understanding of religion, queerness, uh, and their rural identity. And hands down, what I found is that every one of them wanted to stay in rural America. Every one of them wanted to stay. And I think that that's a fantastic testament to the things that, that rural America does offer, right? We have closeness of families, uh, incredibly community oriented. Like, I live and work in Olean. If I want to market anything about my business, I just pitch it as a community building idea. And people are like, yes, we'll drink it up, right? Because that's what we do in rural America. We have close-knit families. They might be crazy, but they're close-knit. And we have strong local communities. We also have a strong connection to the land. And there is a distinct way and rhythm and cadence of doing life in rural America. And it's really important that queer people know they don't have to give that up. When I came out, um, I was a, a pastor's kid. I was assigned female at birth. I understood myself at the time to be cisgendered and straight. Um, so I had not only rural identity, but religious identity to, to battle against in my process of self-actualization. But I chose to come out. But for me, the choice to come out was the choice to have to give up everything about my personality. I had to give up family. I had to give up friends. I had to give up any hope of moving back here. And I had to give up my vocation. And so it's really important that we don't force these dichotomies on a section of the population that is already a vulnerable population. So any way that we can combat the narrative that you have to somehow divest your rural identity to become your truest self we need to work back against that because then we're literally creating a psychological split within the minds of our students. So it's really important that um, LGBTQ people know that they can be rural and queer and there's not an intrinsic divide there. There doesn't have to be. Um, these are some of the other just concerns when we're talking about dealing with and well, not dealing with, that's a terrible and pejorative. When we're talking about working with and supporting rural LGBTQ youth, uh, we need to realize that in a small town, in a small area, when you come out, there is an incredible microscope put on you because there's not more population to dilute it. I literally cannot go to tops. I can't go to tops with a hoodie on. With a hoodie and a mask, people were still stopping me on the way to get my milk. And that's part of, part of my choice because of who I am as a person with public facing skill sets. But there is a, a magnification of um, you when you're different in rural America. It's not a negative or a positive, right? It's not qualitative, it's just a consideration. Another thing we have to consider is that because of how closely knit rural communities are, when a person comes out, it ripples over into other areas of their life. So that's a consideration for us as mental health professionals working with students. We have to see how we can mitigate that rippling or support our children to deal with them because they're going to have it. And it might be positive. Some people will shock you. 
some parents that you thought weren't going to be beneficial are like really on board, just need some tools, right? So it could be good, but we just have to know that that rippling could destabilize our kids a little bit, which is going to affect their life outcomes and their academic performance. So. Um, there's also, we also have to realize there's a lot fewer alternatives. Um, we can't just go to a different school when you're in rural America. Uh, I had a CSE meeting for my queer child before we came here. Uh, my queer child who is also a person with autism and also experiences agoraphobia and uh, extreme depression and anxiety. And we are in having such a hard time to find her, to find them a school where they can fit um, and not be bullied, but then also to find services to access, for them to access so that they can combat their agoraphobia. So we are in a cluster of just trying to pull together whatever resources we can to get my kid to graduate. Because uh, as of now, she hasn't been to school in a year and it's not for lack of trying and it's not her fault. Um, so there are fewer alternatives and we have to deal with that um, geographical and built environment concern when we're working with uh, rural students that are LGBTQ. We also have to deal with the fact that there are less social, uh, there are less support structures, which could be due to social isolation or geographic isolation. Like I said, natural versus built environment. There are concerns. Sometimes we didn't necessarily structure our city wrong. Our city's just 45 minutes from anything of consequence, you know? Um, so it's just a consideration we have to take um, into account. And these are all the different areas that, um, you know, this sort of rural environment has a bearing on all of these different areas. So I'll let you guys check that out more um, in depth later on, okay? So um, a big consideration of our school districts that we have to deal with, we have to reconcile with, is the categoric poverty of rural areas. We exist in the tail end of Appalachia, which is an area of America that is categorized by rural poverty and generational rural poverty. So we're not dealing with just a family who is temporarily experiencing poverty. We're typically dealing with parents who, uh, family structures, who are coming from generations of sorts of patterns of behavior. And in my estimation, there's not a single person that wants to stay in poverty. There might be people who are replicating cycles because that's how they know how to live. But I don't think you're, you're not, you cannot look at me dead in the face and tell me that someone really wants to have to fight the county building to be able to feed their kids. That is not a want. There is no widespread welfare fraud. There is no widespread social services fraud. It actually doesn't exist. Uh, it's just a political dog whistle. We are dealing with people who are living in systems and structures and built environments and geographic environments that mitigate their ability to access wealth and social capital. So we are dealing with that factor when we talk about rural LGBTQ students. We have to consider the effect of rural poverty. Um, I wanted to look up the stats, but I, and I completely forgot, but I know Olean is an all free lunch district. And we are the cultural hub. We are the urban center of our county. What? With COVID, there are two districts in Cataraugus County that did not, three, okay. districts in Cataraugus County that did not qualify for free lunch for everyone. And right now, everyone has because of COVID. Yeah. What, how many, go how many districts do we have in our county? 13 districts, um, two private schools, and then one, almost two alternatives. Okay, okay. Yeah, so I mean, you could do, I'm not going to do the math because I don't do math, I do thoughts. But um, that's, it's like, it is a great ratio of our area that is federally earmarked as, as rural poverty. Um, and, and to be realistic, we know these things to be true. Um, I always like to point out that like the richest person in Olean is maybe cracking into middle, middle class range. Like, and, and that looks rich because of where we live. You know what I mean? But even some of the richer folks in our area, the more stable more people who have access to more social capital are still like not too many paychecks away from a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And so we're dealing with that as a hallmark of anybody that we work with in our area. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to front as I'm 34 years old, I think. Um, for the pandemic, I thought I was one year older than I was for the whole year. So now I, I can't tell if I'm wrong or if people think I'm lying, but I'm like somewhere in that early 30s range. And I've never not qualified for social services. And I've had a W-2 since I was 14. And I've never not qualified for social services. I only for one year of my life that I have I had private pay health insurance. These are things that as a college educated, articulate person who's able to self-advocate, I still live in the environment of rural poverty. So that's gonna to come to bear on our students and our family structures. And when you work with students, you're not just working with students, you're working with family structures. So, 
Um, I thought this fact was really interesting. Uh, more students attend rural schools than attend schools in New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, and incredibly, the next 75 largest school districts combined. So there's rural students are here. And rural poverty is a thing, particularly as we're, like I said, we're on the tail end, northern end of Appalachia. We're, de we're definitively dealing with a large population of students, even though we don't see it in our area, because it's a small school, we're dealing with a large subset of the demographic of America, you know? Um, yes, and 64% of rural counties have high rates of, tr of child poverty. So 64% of those uh, rural schools are dealing with rural poverty. So um, it's just, it's, the reality of how our, our economy and our structure is set up at the moment, but these are the factors that come to bear on us working with kids. So this is one of the first levels of intersectionality. Um, I wanted to talk about a little bit about LGBTQ student climate. There is an organization called uh, GLSEN. I don't cite them on this page, but it's G-L-S-E-N. Uh, it's gay and lesbian something education network. <laughs> I can't, I wanted to say it's student, but I think it's not. I can't remember. If I'm wrong, I'm going to look like a dummy, but um, yeah, but it's G-L-S-E-N. And they do, a, they do a school climate service survey regularly. In the zip file that I provided for you, I have the most recent one that I could find, which is 2017. I suspect it was a biannual study that was derailed by COVID, but that's the most recent one I could find. But they do a school climate survey where they particularly interview LGBTQ students. Um, and they, they brought out these facts, so I'm just going to read them to you real quick. Um, LGBT students in rural areas have reported the most hostile school climates and that they're more likely to have negative and dangerous experiences at school. Of course, that's going to make attending school a barrier to success, not even the coursework, just attending. And that was, that was one of the problems that my own uh, children faced, was just the barrier to simply attending, not even academic performance. So that's something that we're looking at. Um, and again, that's from the uh, LGBTQ rural map, if it's not cited up elsewhere. 80% um, of LGBTQ students in rural communities said they have frequently or often heard gay used in a negative way. I was listening to a podcast on the way here where they pulled some data from that um, school climate survey from GLSEN, and uh, as many as like 15 to 20% of kids heard the negative use of ter the term gay from school um, staff and faculty. So that's wildly important. Um, I'm currently a member of the Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Committee at the Olean City School Districts. So we've had quite a public struggle with um, members of our school staff and faculty uh, and administration speaking openly and publicly in derogatory ways to our students, um, all the way from administration down to aid. And it, is, it doesn't create a welcome and opening environment for students because they hear and they see. That's just the reality of it. We, this is a safe space. We're assuming good intention well, here. No, I want you to understand kind of what I've just kind of been seeing a lot. So, you know, way back when, if you used the N word, that was a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. But now, a lot of black Americans use the word nigga, nigger. It's in songs. It's, it's like, like it's used and it's okay. That's almost what we're seeing with the word gay. So for me, the sole defining factor of how this plays out sociologically is really important to understand because it has to do with power dynamics. So when you're a part, when you are a member of, of a marginalized and oppressed socio or socio or economic demographic, you retain the right to identify and speak about your experiences as you wish, because. The idea is a reclamation. You can't be, you're not being derogatory yourself, you're taking something back. And it's been used at you and it's part of your culture, so you might as well own it. Um, and so I see that in very similar ways uh, in usages in the way that the word queer is used. Um, I, as a white person, categorically hold a position of power over a non-white person. So it's not my place to use a word that has been construed as derogatory in casual conversation. And I think I encounter the word queer in much the same way. Um, there is, I use queer regularly and very proudly, and I will never recant that because it has been meant to be a weapon towards me and I will not accept that weaponization anymore. And I think it's the same way with gay. Uh, as a gay person, I can say I'm gay. 
Um, as a gay person, I will occasionally colloquially refer to myself as faggy because, funny story, the more testosterone I have and the bigger my beard gets, the more I'm like, hey, makeup and short shorts. I don't know. I don't try to parse these things out. I just let it happen. Literally wouldn't wear shorts above my knees before I transition. And now I'm like, booty shorts for pride? Hey. Um, but for, for me, the use of the word queer and the use of that terminology is this is my stake and this is my community and this is my identity and I wield the right to use it. And I think that it is a conversation about terminology rests very largely on the power dynamic of a social structure. And so I, I, I actually, I did a, as a public example, very publicly, um, two years ago in a city council meeting, I had collected um, tangible, tangible public comments uh, on Facebook on either news and media outlets or public posts of people that were saying racist things about the Black Lives Matter movement in Olean. I decided, in typical Leo fashion, I decided to make a sculpture I've never sculpted before, ever in my life. And so the first sculpture I decided to do was a four, a four foot tall fist. So a four foot tall anatomical figure, and it was the week before my wedding. My wife was like, oh. But I decided to sculpt a four foot tall fist and cover it with quotes, with racist quotes, from Olean area residents on public Facebook forums in a two week period. There were more quotes than I could fit on a 360 degree representation of a fist in Olean. And when I was recounting that, I made that fist and I wheeled it into a city council meeting and I set it right in front of the mayor. And not a single mayor or council person acknowledged the presence of that statue the entire time, which is wildly ironic because on the front of the fist, I had a Facebook post from a black person in Olean that said it's hard to fight racism in a town that doesn't acknowledge it exists. So this, I say this all to set the stage of what I'm about to tell you. I wanted to read, just read a list of the quotes from that fist. And I didn't want to insert my own words because it's not my, the story of racism in Olean is not my story to tell. But if it's not safe for, for people who are not white to speak up, I have to placehold. And so I figured I would placehold by reading these quotes. But I actually said the N-word. And it was on there probably 50 or 60 times. Um, and I said it because it was a, a recantation of what other people were saying. But that was absolutely an inappropriate move. And I was corrected by a friend of mine after that, who I have great respect for, actually someone you probably know, Officer Divine. Um, I love that guy, dude, he's so awesome. We message all the time, like little old ditties. Uh, but he came up to me in the gym and he's like, I really respect what you're doing. I just had to let you know that was like a really off-putting um, thing to hear you say those words. And I understand the context, but it didn't work like that. And, and I, I, I've come to understand that it's because of, it's because of a system of power dynamics. So no matter what, no matter how many songs it's in, no matter how many times a black person says it, it's not my word to say. And I feel much the same way with the use of the word queer or the use of the word gay or the use of the word fag. It's not mine to use. Um, and so that's kind of how I approach terminology. Does that give you kind of a, I know it's anecdotal, but I'm hoping that maybe it's some vulnerability there will help you understand how I understand word usage. Um, because the N word, um, has never been meant to edify someone when it's coming from white lips to a black person. It just never has um, because it didn't originate in that manner. And, and with queer, it's a little bit different because, because queer wasn't innately a negative term. It just meant weird. Um, and then it was weaponized. So I'm on, a, I'm on a process of reclamation that doesn't mirror the use of the N-word because there's different social dynamics. But I think you really have to consider the power dynamics in a social setting when you choose the use of words. Um, and that, that's really important when you look at it because I can say I'm gay. And then, as has happened, someone can verbally assault me in front of my place of business screaming that I'm gay and that I'm a faggot. And those things had two very different implications. By the way, the Olean Police Department didn't care. It was on video. It's fine. It's only the third time that I've been a victim of a hate crime in Olean and they won't report it. So uh, that was just a little diatribe. Back to the speech. <laughs> so if we were to, if we were to you know, someone was ask, say someone was asking about your mm -hmm. describing you know, a tra the training. Yeah. You know, if we were to give a description in that way. Yeah. You know, how you identify yourself. Yep. Feel free to use the words that I use to identify self, myself in like telling my story to other people. Does that make sense? Because yeah. I think that keeps the power dynamic in my narrative as opposed to someone else's view of my narrative. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I think that's, and I'm, I'm saying it in that way because I want to help you figure out how I would navigate a situation where I was mirroring this. The divergence for me would be if I'm talking about a student who is stealth or is not out in all areas of their life. Like, so for me, I'm out, I'm not stealth, 
I'm unapologetically out. Um, so you, you can use my you know, identifiers safely, um, relatively safely, after I just told you a story about being verbally assaulted in front of my business. Oh, you can use my identifiers relatively safely. As long as I'm not screaming it out. Right, as long as I'm screaming Oh my God, my grandma was there and my family is not LGBTQ friendly. And I was like, please fucking leave, please leave, please leave. That was the worst, man. Elle wasn't there either because Elle would have, Mm. I married a spicy Latina, man. She would have <laughs> popped off. <laughs> She's definitely popped off at Walmart cashiers who wouldn't let me buy beer with my children present. One beer to make beer cheese fondue. And Elle was like, it's because my children are black and he's white because that's my children's father. And all my kids just scattered like cockroaches. <laughs> they literally were like, we need your friend's ID. And I was like, you mean my 13 year old? <laughs> what? Okay. Anyways, this is just now becoming a story about Leo's life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they'll use it in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that's so gay. Like, yes. No, find your word. Yes. Like, that's not what you meant. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and then, exactly. And usually that's an easy phrase to like call them out, but not be like, you're a bad Right, person. exactly. Like, like we just don't say that anymore. Same with the R word. Yes, exactly. Know, like, it's, it's just find a new word. Yep, that's exactly. Not what you meant to say. Yep, find a new word. Like, be, let's be articulate here. Yep. You can say what you mean. And if it is a commentary about how gay my yep. outfit is, if I'm wearing a very gay shirt, I'm going to accept that. I actually wore this in honor of the students at Salamanca High School. Um, the students at Salamanca High School lobbied for the hanging of the uh, the Pride Progress flag last year during Pride Month, and they had me come speak at the um, installation of it. So this is in honor. This is on the honor of the work that the students did in Salamanca. This is here on the ground in our area. The Salamanca students did this, so I wore this in honor of them today. Um, because they, you know, like if, if if I was there and they're like, you're so gay, and I'd be like, heck yeah, I am. That's the whole point. Um, but you know, that woman in front of my shop was really not going for the same effect, you know. So <laughs> um, the other thing that becomes important in terms of student climate, we have to consider their home lives as well. Uh, and according to the HRC LGBTQ youth report, don't remember what year, but it's in the handout. 67% um, of the LGBTQ youth report that they've heard family members make negative comments about uh, LGBTQ people. And it's important to realize though, this this statistic doesn't say that it was wielded at the student. But it sets the climate that it is not okay to come out. And we set a climate in our schools by how we speak before a student ever comes out to us. There it is. That is the tip of the iceberg. There's so much that happens before they come out. So. All right. Uh, a couple more facts. These are both from the HRC LGBTQ report. 67% uh, of youth report that they've heard family members make negative comments about LGBTQ people, and 77% of youth report receiving unwanted sexual comments, jokes, and gestures in the past year. Um, it's pretty easy to see with this that we have uh, the perfect storm for uh, mental health struggles. We also have a perfect storm for public safety issues. Um, because words precede actions a lot of the time. It's scarier when they don't, and they just come out of nowhere. But um, I think it was Oprah or Maya Angelou. I was watching an interview with both of them. I can't remember who said it. Um, but one of them said, a, a person that tells you who they are right away, it's your job to believe them or not. And when we, le when we see statistics like LGBTQ youth, minors, being the subject of unwanted sexual gestures, jokes, comments, that's priming the pump for a mental health crisis and a, a physical safety and public health issue. So to not combat that is to, in effect, build a public health crisis in tier schools. I guess I just keep thinking, and I'm running over quite a few specific mm -hmm. families, students that I have now, and use the term perfect storm. It yeah. is, and they're also minors, like you said. So I have par some parents that are totally accepted. Mm -hmm very cool about everything mm -hmm. and easy to work with mm -hmm. for me and the students. Mm -hmm. But there's also the parents that disagree. Right. So when I have a student in front of me in school that's open with me, but mm -hmm. then I receive a phone call from their parent, my student's a minor. You have to tell me this information, da da da, -da. Mm -hmm. It's just such a slippery slope. Yeah, so this this legislation, um, which I'm going to hand out to you, it's called the uh, Federal Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And just, uh, the acronym is FERPA. It gives you a lot of guidelines about what you can and can't disclose. And it, the most important thing is that it gives you a legal reason for what you can and can't disclose. And that includes their legal guardian. 
Yep, yep, yeah. And I have, like I said, I have a handout with all of this, um, and it's really good. But it gives you, it gives you something to stand on other than your own conscious. You know what I mean? It gives you a yeah. tool in your tool belt to just figure out what and how to disclose. Because so. at this point, like, I'm making referrals to our school principal right. to speak to parents mm -hmm. because my relationship and my rapport with my student is what it is. Yes. That's yeah. mine. Yeah, exactly. He can handle the... Yeah. <laughs> which I feel bad in saying that. No, he dude, can. he gets paid for that. <laughs> okay, so long, but I, uh, it is above yeah. my pay grade, and I don't know legalities and yep. all this stuff. Um, and I know we've talked about before the power school name change, preferred name versus legal name change, mm -hmm. things like this. What a student's called at school versus what they're called at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to be able to switch on some of those. Um, how many of you guys, I'm just curious, how many of you folks had, when you were in elementary school or high school, had your teachers hand out like an index card at the beginning of the year? And they said like, put your name, favorite color, favorite snack, birthday, and what you like to be called on it. I did that every year of my entire secondary and post-secondary education. And it's a, pref a preferred name is in a lot of ways no different than that. Uh, but you're, you're relating with this student colloquial on a daily basis. Uh, it, it's on you then to switch um, when you're referring to parents or stuff. But that, the way you refer to a person in front of you, um, I always think of it in terms of counseling, like the, ch the child is your client. And you know the parent, the school district, and the parents relate in a different way. But in terms of being a guidance counselor, the child is your client. Yeah. And then it's—I just—we take on this responsibility of making sure that, like, the substitute in the room has, yeah. has where it's like, okay, when we're in a rural small community, we give a substitute. We pass along this preferred name. Mm -hmm. The substitute's free to go wherever they want in the community and say, oh, I was told to call so, uh, call so and so, so. -and -so. I think that would still fall under FERPA. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the substitutes are employees of yeah. the school district, and they have to follow the same guidelines. And if they don't, call them right out. Like, yeah. that's just your job. If I do my job wrong, I get in trouble. You know what I mean? And I'm not dealing, I'm dealing with aesthetics, not legalities. You know what I mean? Um, but I would think that a, a substitute would fall, absolutely fall under those same guidelines. I and would. They don't have to, like, the substitute doesn't have to know necessarily that why they're being sure. called, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, they yeah. could just be, that could be a nickname. And, like, hey, that's what their nickname is. is yep. You know, sure. Yeah. They don't have to know anything more than that. They don't have to know the details. No. In, it is stuff. Like, well, and in the school, there's just so many, well, you guys know this, so many hands in the pot. Yeah. So many opinions, so many ways, styles, mm -hmm. ways of communicating, mm -hmm. things like that. So in the in, in the In the end, New York State is one of, like, a, a very small amount of states where LGBTQ people are actually a protected population. Mm -hmm. That's why I live here now. Because I, I, for, I'm not saying it makes me physically safer, but I'm saying someone will get in trouble if they hurt me, hopefully. I don't know. After I told the story about the person in front of my shop, I'm now saying this with regret. But, um, but, but there are protections for LGBTQ people as minority status. And I, there's no point in pulling punches at this point. If you just can't respect a person's personhood and you can't figure it out, you don't deserve to work with them. And you shouldn't be being paid by federal funding. Yes. So just because this is a reoccurring theme, yeah. there's actually, correct me if I have this right or not, there's more risk for a school or a school employee to out a student who isn't mm -hmm. than there is for not telling the parent mm -hmm. what they want to know. Yes, legally, absolutely. Okay. Just wanted to yep. And the only thing that we have a right to tell a parent is if they are a threat to themselves. Yep, or others. Or others, or somebody is hurting Right, yeah. And, and to share with, with you what they want. But typically, that's my process is I'll call a parent and say, you know, I just, you know, I, I had, had Jackson in my office today, just wanted to give you a heads up, and, you know, everything's fine, mm -hmm. and, you know, he can share with you it once he gets home. And, yeah. Um, you know, unless that, you know, and sometimes I'll ask the, the student, do you mind if I share this information with them? Yeah. Um, but, yeah. 
but yeah, yeah, and you have legal protection for that, and you have there's legal recourse if that's not followed. I, I'm not a legal scholar, but I did come prepared with that um, because uh, thanks, it, it, you know, definitely in large degree to Bree from um, Cataracus Community Action as well for the conversation we had about it. She was literally in my chair last night, so we could chat about it. It's fine. We were there till like nine o'clock. It's good. Well, yeah, right. Thanks a lot, jerk. <laughs> I don't know, but like three of my friends showed up with beer too, and she was my last person. I was like, hey, what's going on, guys? <laughs> it was cheaper than going out, so. Um, just a couple more quick facts. Uh, Glisson's research shows that when rural schools have GSAs, LGBTQ students are more likely to attend school. Not the GSA even, just literally just attend school. Um, and it suggests that GSAs, gay straight alliances, uh, in particular play a unique role in supporting rural LGBTQ students. Uh, we talked about fewer alternatives and lack of access to resources. So um, the creation of safe space in schools is of primary uh, concern in supporting rural LGBTQ youth. Given that schools are also a social, social and cultural center of rural communities, school rejection means that an LGBTQ student is not just denied access to education, but also vital social connection and opportunities. Um, the school, in many ways, uh, queers the boundary between sacred and secular, and it kind of fulfills a lot of roles that we would think that churches do, and I'm saying this as a religious professional, uh, in terms of community building, service distribution, uh, mentorship, relationship, support. Schools do a lot of those same functions, just Sam the preaching hopefully um but but if we did you know if we deny our kids access to that safe space here there's in, in old reality they're not getting it elsewhere in our communities and like i said this statistic really got me um because i was expecting this statistic to be about the attendance at gay straight alliances or participation no it's literally just more likely to attend school if there's a gsa they might never go to that gsa but they know it's there right and i think in that um stuff that we us this morning um, there is information about how to either start or support an there is essay, yep and a lot of information that came from the actual students yep. who are involved yep so yeah, and if you need modeling resources, if you need local connections, I've, Laura Kopeck is the GSA advisor at Olean. You know that. Oh, awesome. Together. Right on. I just, um, finishing grad school. Very cool. Yeah, I just met her recently as a result of my continued <laughs> vocal presence at school board meetings um, uh, but we've spoken recently and I really enjoy her as a person that's really cool to know that you were kind of there in the beginning of it um, also Justin Hubbard who is an educator at Salamanca is a fantastic resource about organizing student groups uh, the group that put on the Salamanca Pride Day was actually not a GSA. It was a student activism club that was started by the students. They petitioned Mr. Hubbard. Mr. Hubbard simply supported, and they've been creating tangible change in their actual culture of their schools. So both of those people are really good resources in terms of who's literally doing the work already locally within the school system. So they'll know a lot of the particulars about both your populations and your legalities. Uh, Justin is an amazing person. I'm high, he's one of my favorite people. Literally, I met him one time at this thing, but we talked literally probably three or four times a week via Zoom um, every day during the pandemic, and then we've been collaborating ever since. So both of those people are, are great resources locally. Um, and Salamanca is a really great school in terms of diversity and inclusion. They have some fantastic resources, so I'll encourage you to hit them up. So. Um, so our third sort of consideration here is LGBTQ youth and mental health issues. 40% um, of LGBTQ youth seriously consider attempting suicide in the past 12 months, with more than half of them uh, the being transgender and non-binary youth. Uh, I included this survey on LGBTQ mental health in the zip file that I'm sending you. It's from the Trevor Project, which is a national outreach organization. They run a hotline. Uh, they have a whole resource page for uh, students, and it's actually really cool. Um, they have a function on their website that if you hit escape three times in a row, it'll instantly close their browser, um, so as to en enable students to be able to look this up without fear of someone looking over their shoulder. There's a quick out out of their website, which I thought was a really cool feature. I just discovered that today. I think it deletes the, the search Yep, so uh, I, I, would, I wouldn't have thought of that, and I think that's a fantastic resource. But the Trevor Project uh, is really incredibly, incredibly valuable resource for stats on LGBTQ um, youth. Uh, LGBTQ youth uh, homelessness and mental health also really coincide because LGBTQ youth are disproportionately represented in the unaccompanied and homeless youth category um, in America. Uh, 
Chaplain Hall at the University of Chicago released a report on youth homelessness, um, and they found that LGBTQ youth had, or young adults, had 120% higher risk of reporting homelessness compared to youth who identified as heterosexual and cisgender. 120% is like a real big number. Uh, anytime it goes over 100, it's hyperbole, you know? And I hate hyperbole, so I never say that I 200% agree with something unless I really agree with it. And there's 120% of youth, um, of homeless youth are LGBTQ and we're, you know, experiencing homelessness. Uh, also, estimates show that LGBTQ youth comprise up to 40% of the unaccompanied youth population, even though they make up only 5 to 10% of the overall youth population. Do you find that in our rural area that there is a lot of youth that are homeless? Yes. Um, yes, I do. And yeah, it depends on who you ask. And I'm going to share an anecdotal story, if that's all right with you, um, because I did work in housing and, and, um, and hope, uh, an employment services in the YWC at uh, Bradford. And one of the main w ways that we register homelessness in the United States is through HUD, um, which is our federal, it's a federal housing program, right? So HUD does a point in time survey, one day of the year, where they go out at 6 a.m. across time zones, and they just visually look for homeless people. I never once saw one homeless person in Bradford, yet my shelter was always at capacity. And that has to do with the methods of data collection. So when we talk about homelessness um, and housing insecurity, people have an urban slant on homelessness. They expect it to be people living under a bridge or people living in the alley, but the ways in which rural people experience homelessness and housing insecurity is much different. It has to do with not having a, a safe structure, not having a repetitive place to sleep, having to deal with couch surfing, having to deal with being shuffled from family home to family home in particular for youth. So the ways in which um, housing insecurity and homelessness present in rural, uh, the, in rural populations and certainly that would play out to rural youth, it looks different. And so I would assert, I would posit that HUD actually misses the mark in terms of rural poverty. Right, I mean, and like I know that like for us, you know, if they're doubled up, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, moving around, mm -hmm. I would just, I'm just wondering if you found that students who are in that LGBTQ community mm -hmm if they find that. Yeah. You know, they're moving I'm currently with helping house a student right now in Orleans, so. They're moving around with their families. Yeah, no. Doubling up with their families, or if they themselves individually are dealing God, with you homelessness. Say yeah, it's, um, so you it's know a little what bit mean? of both, but it's more likely that they would be displaced from their family unit of mm -hmm. origin and staying with whoever will mm -hmm. let them stay, or they've identified a person who supports them yeah that's um, yeah and they stay there because it's safer and easier um i'm technically the runaway homeless youth um, are you the mckinney vento liaison um so no so each school district has has a mckinney vento okay um and then the runaway and homeless youth there has to be someone in each county oh okay it kind of like the youth bureau. got you however when i started my position in june um, I was told that there are no homeless youth in Cattaraugus County. Um, I have a lot of knowledge and experience of your position, so I'm making no comments. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so, I mean, obviously, each school district has their own definition based on the community metro. And then, um, typically, what happens is when, when teenagers show up at DSS or somewhere like that, they either end up with a neglect petition on the family or a pin petition on the kids. And that's that's why they don't end up mm -hmm. with me mm -hmm. is because it's one or the other and that's why a lot of youth don't report yes. that they're homeless because they'll either get sent back to the tragedy that they came from or they'll get in trouble or both. Yeah, that was the condition. Um, I uh, One of my children is actually, well, none of them are biologically mine. Um, but they're mine, and don't come for me on that, because some people are like, oh, they're not really your kids, and I'm like, I'll fight you, because they've all puked on me. Um, but my oldest daughter is actually not my wife's biologically, but she was a dis she was a homeless youth. She was a displaced youth when we took her in, and so she qualified for McKinney Vento Services, and only on dropping the whole damn ball on that. Um, but she, she wasn't counted in the statistics, because 
they didn't see her, you know what I mean? But she was a homeless and unaccompanied youth. Um, I'm also working with a friend and her wife uh, to house an LGBT youth who's been displaced from their home violently um, in Olean with just a, in the past month. And they're, I know they're not accounted for in any sort of official census. So yeah, it, it definitely does is, and is actively happening. Uh, I just think we miss a lot of it because of the ways in which homelessness in general is measured. Um, we need to think about it from a rural lens as well. So I, I, think, I think we miss the picture because of the method of capturing data. That's, that'd be my assertion in this case. So, but you would you would certainly know the ins and outs of that in our uh, area. Oh, I'm yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. I'm taking I it all in. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk real quick. This is the specific paragraph that I pulled out of this handout from the gender inclusive schools. That's also in the zip file. I don't know how many times I said that today, but we should have taken some sort of like shot every time. Um, but I'm gonna read it word for word to you because I don't want to mess this up. New York State Education Law 2-D prohibits the unauthorized re authorized release of students' personally identifiable information, including but not limited to the student's name, indirect identifiers, and other information that alone or in combination is linked or linkable to a specific student that would allow a reasonable person in the school community to identify the student. The Federal Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, known as FERPA, also protects the privacy of students' educational records and places restrictions on the release of students' personally identifiable information. For specific inquiries regarding what constitutes the unauthorized release of a student's personally identifiable information, school districts should consult their attorneys. For more information, you can visit the link listed below to see the Parents' Bill of Rights and Data Privacy. Um, this document includes a hyperlink to that um, space so you can check it out. So for release, like I've gotten verbal release from students, so um, is that sufficient? I wouldn't do anything based on verbal release, just speaking as my history as a social sure, worker. Because I have it on, I have it in my own documentation that we met and spoke about it, but I would document it very explicitly. He, and I did. Okay. Thankfully. Yeah. But he didn't sign anything um, because he had to apply um, to college uh -huh. using his legal name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would think that um, in that case, and this is speaking for me as a previous social worker and not as a lawyer, so a caveat made, sure. I would make that a very specific and identifiable point of conversation and maybe have some sort of form or something that they sign because I want the students to have a full understanding of their autonomy in a situation and their rights in a situation. That would be what I would say. Beyond that, I would, you'd probably have to refer to your school attorneys, but their identification is protected and it does merit a release. Like if we've all still got to sign a HIPAA form and most people don't even know what HIPAA does, we should, I, I would do something more formal than just case noting it, would be my thought. Okay. That would be my thought. But yeah, prefer names, prefer names, pronouns, um, gender identity, sexual orientation, those all count as personally yes. identifiable information. That any reasonable person in the school community would know. Yep, them. yep, absolutely. Okay. And that's regardless of your student's age. Yep. So my question is, you remember how your administration, where does that fall as far as that? So just to give you a little, because we had talked a little bit about this, so mm -hmm. we always have um, we always have students who they generally they come to the counselor first mm -hmm. and say, how do I change my name? Mm -hmm. And we had um, a young lady that I thought who really wanted to take it mm -hmm. all the way. Um, so anyway, so I went to administration and I said, so what is, because we had new administration, mm -hmm. and was told, you know, I said, how do, how do we go about changing the student's name? Now, I had one student who was transgender mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. He's already graduated. Um, we changed all the, um, at the parents' request, mm -hmm. um, he later went on to get a legal mm -hmm. name change. Mm -hmm. um, so we changed everything to Kyle mm -hmm. for him. Um, so I wanted to know, okay, what is, what is the process with this new student? Because at that point she was in seventh grade, mm -hmm. eighth grade. She was eighth grade. And um, so administration consulted, um, oh my gosh, Pam, 
for court? The lawyer. Yeah. The lawyer. Mm -hmm. And our administration has this thing called something else, a preferred name. If it relates to their name somehow, we're okay. So, for example, we had a young lady by the name of Julia. Mm -hmm. She wanted to go by J. Mm -hmm. That's fine. J, Julia, not a problem. We had another young lady with the name of Danielle that wanted to go by Jack. Absolutely not. It has nothing to do with Danielle. That's just bigotry in action. So, <laughs> they're, they put a, I can't call it a policy, they put a procedure in place that says if a student would like to go by an alternate name, both of their parents can come in with the child and request it or have a meeting with the counselor and the principal and after the meeting they can put it in writing that it is okay for the teachers to call little Susie John. That's not legal. So that's that's, that's not legally that policy or suggestion is not legal. Where if, if when we're having this conversation, we're talking about legalities and that what they're doing would be quite easily quantifiable as illegal <laughs> because a legal name change. So I'll, I'll break. I, I've been through legal name change, so I'll tell you some real quick facts on that. It's awful <laughs> because there's no one single repository for name change in the United States. So even if you've never changed your gender, if you've been married and you've changed your last name, it is the worst process ever. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just the worst. Um, but that is a, a legal process that occurs that is initiated. Um, you can go to the county clerk, Alan Bernstein. Um, I was the first person to change their name and gender legally in Cattaraugus County. So Alan um, is a super dope guy and puts he literally like put together a document for state or for county clerks statewide on how to initiate a legal name change. So um, that is something that would have to be pursued in re relationships to a person's age. If they're under 18, they'd have to pursue it with parental consent. And when we're talking about legality, this is not a legality. This is just simply giving the child and the student their personhood. And, and under this law, where you, we owe them that. You respect. owe them that. Well, you we, owe them that respect. By law, we have to. Yes, like, yeah. By law, if a student comes to us, and says, I am choosing to identify, they are self-advocating, mm -hmm. and choosing to identify as Johnny, Billy, doesn't matter. Lu like, it can be Lucille. Whatever, it yeah. Matter. Red, law. sprocket, like I don't care, whatever it is, yeah, yeah, it's, that's yeah. what they're, yeah. As long as it's, well, no, I don't think it even matters, even if it was like derogatory, I don't think it was. No, no. <laughs> By law, we have to respect that child's wish and the parents do not have to be involved in it at all. Especially if the if the child is saying it on their own, mm -hmm. you need to delineate if it's even safe to tell the parents right. that. And, and then the only, so one barrier with that, just in my, in my, so a power school, for example, it has a student access, so the teacher access, and then the parent access, like I can go on and check all my kids. Oh, okay, and okay. And stuff. I see what you're saying. So yeah. when I go on there, how do you, have one name at school on their document that they prefer without also outing them by changing in the system and sending things that, home. That's one thing. You, we, we, can't, can't, we can't legally change anything in the system. Right. Because it because was. Because you have to legally, you have to match their so, person. Yeah. So other than, yeah. Um, yeah. other than power school. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. when this is what everything you else you have to and yeah. we're trying to find out if power school, like, because, like, in our system in power schools, like, we have, like, the extra screens yeah. for, like, uh, like, where they have their logins, where they have all this, like, all the other extra stuff in the mm -hmm. power school. And we're finding out if we can put in there and have them add in, like, preferred names mm -hmm. where it's not going to come up <coughs> for the parents. Yes. See. So did we break the law in changing it in power school? I, well, because when you print the report card, what did that show up? It's at, so I, my students, I would think that that would be a legality, and it probably would be. A, yeah. I would say it's not even a legal gray area. And I'm saying this not as a lawyer. It seems like that that logically would be going against so, this piece of legislation. The the unless they're yes, okay with it. Yeah. In this if it was a situation, yes. Have that, Evan so. and his parents Were. came to us. Okay, okay. However, he was formally, but they wouldn't. She, the, the, right. the problem is, but that's still the problem. See, the problem comes in the the fact where when you're sending out transcripts yeah. Yeah. and things like that, and that can that that, that, that that name. Yeah, you just have to put you have to put the legal name for that. So that's why yeah. it came up. Well, yeah. So yeah. so Ella applied to college. Yeah. I 
it, he asked me to write his letter of recommendation. You have to use the legal name. Evan. I would honestly, in that situation, what I do, since it's a colloquial exchange that you're talking about in terms of a letter, mm -hmm. I would put a pre, uh, a pre uh, formerly, known uh, yeah, formerly known as, or just a little footnote at the bottom. I'm referring to this student by their by their name um, in the letter. It is important to note that they're, they're, it is attached to this legal name. Well, all of his documents say Evan because we changed it in power school, but he submitted his application Ella. Yeah, you. That's and uh, honestly, why I went to my principal and I got yeah, it sounds like it sounds like from that aspect, you would that would need to be turned back because it sounds progressive, but it's just not actually legal. Yeah. Um, and but then also schools too. Like my son is transgender and applied with his legal name, but all of his ID, his report card, his documents say his name Al, which is not legally changed yet because he's a slowpoke. But um, he's aiming to get it changed before he graduates so that his diploma will match his, his name. So, and that's the thing, we have a student and they and their, their parents went um, uh, because they refer to they and them and they went ahead and la last year came in, we're referring to this is my name, um, and brought in new birth certificate, new social security. So then it's legal about, at that yeah, point. Just, yeah. just, legal new, yeah. Yeah. just, yeah. New, just about a month ago. Yeah. And so we went in, we changed all of That's great for names. them. Yeah. yeah. And so now um, they're going to be a senior next year. And so, you know, we were like, perfect. So They'll get a diploma with their name on it. They're going to get all sorry. their names. Yeah. yeah. So, so now they're, they're, they're going to get everything set. In that how we got around the power school issue when his parents and him came in together and asked about changing, being able to put his name on his paperwork. Um, it was clearly explained to them, you know, that that's fine, but state tests and regents, you're still going to have to fill out yeah. Anna, yeah. Matt Kyle. Yeah. But in power school, what we did is it literally says, you know, it goes last name first, which I will say, so last name. Hannah, in parentheses, Kyle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what we did in power school for the students who hadn't, because he didn't get his name changed until after he graduated. So it, it, their legal name is connected, but you're still. Yeah. Yeah. So everything that we would print out, report cards and everything, literally says Hannah, Kyle. So, well, and my came up too was it's just going to be bad with like fast and college fun connections. And, yeah, like yeah. the yeah. application and your letter. Because we have two and, other students who are in tenth grade. They did not. They haven't changed their legal names, but we changed them in power school. So they were signing up for college courses, and they didn't their exist. legal names were on there. Yeah. But in terms of our power school and class, they don't exist. Yeah. Listener, they don't exist. Yeah. So as, as far as a legal document, it needs to have their legal yeah. name. If there's a way to include the preferred name, that would obviously be ideal. But yeah. as far as like your academic, your school record is a legal document. Yeah, it's like a driver's license or insurance card. Yeah. 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 So to, and, and to get your name or your. I mean, so there's two ways around it for those students in particular. I'm so sorry. I did not mean to interrupt you. That was a jerk move. I got a beard and then I got toxic masculinity. What are you going to do? Um, <laughs> uh, so for that, so for those students, I would just explain to them, like literally legally, this is where we're at. I will acknowledge your personhood just until you have a legal name change. Um, because these documents follow you, we have to use what is your legal name. And then if they want to, and if it's safe, you can direct them to Alan Bernstein, who literally now has a worksheet of how to change their name. Um, and and I, that worksheet will be applicable to any, um, it would be beneficial to any New York State resident, not not just in Kendrick County. So. They're really accepting of it. Like, so, because at our center, um, we always will print off two certificates for them. Like, because we do the honor roll, we do the high, like, all that every quarter, and, like, outdating the student. So if any of our first, first students, like, choose, like, get the award or whatever, we always print off two certificates. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. Like, even, like, last year, we had a student who um, did not have their name changed in time, mm -hmm. and we had to have the diploma with their legal name. So we, when we announced... We announced mm -hmm. their preferred mm -hmm. name, mm -hmm. you know, and their preferred name was actually on the program, 
Cool. But, but we couldn't. You just can't put it on the diploma. Because then it, it, it would be. Put it on the diploma, you know, because we didn't have it legally. Yeah. Let so, me tell you how many I mean, times I haven't legally, legally existed. We, we kept telling, we kept telling him, please go do it. Do yeah, 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 yeah. Please go do your stuff. And he it was took, just pokey yeah. and didn't It took through. five years into my legal transition before my insurance card was in my name. Five years after the judge signed my documents. It took to get my insurance well, card changed. You, so there are moments. Yeah. Because Alex was like, it took, it took them like two months. Oh my God, amazing. It's fantastic. So thanks for paying the way. Yeah, no that. problem. <laughs> Where are you located? Portville. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I don't, I don't know. I know a, a trans Alex from Oland, but not from Portville. So uh, I just happen to know these, like these queer children and they know me. So I was like, okay, cool. I thought I might know them, but um, I wanted to just real quick, we don't have to stop our discussion. I just wanted to end with this because I uh, like the formal part with this because I didn't want you guys to miss this. We don't have a ton of resources in our area. But um, these are two people slash organizations that I would recommend to you. Your first and absolute and most ultimate connection point for resources regarding LGBTQ youth, in particular related to counseling related issues, would be Brianne Abbott. She's a licensed clinical social worker um, and she is a trauma informed therapist at. Uh, it's, it's not connecting, connecting communities in action, right? CCA, uh, which was formerly. Uh, Community action? Yeah. Yes. They did a rebranding. Sorry, I was on the board pre rebranding. And so I, I like left the board right as the rebranding started. So I'm still stuck in the, the pre brand. Um, but Brianne Abbott, and this is her phone number, her pronouns are also on there as a fun way of just normalizing conversation and creating safe space, just adding your pronouns casually to the beginning of your conversations, to your emails, on your door. You don't need, I mean, your if you. Name. Yeah, on your Zoom name, just put them somewhere where people can see them because it's an instant signifier that it's okay to have a conversation about pronouns with you. So I included Bree's pronouns on here. Bree is also an amazing human with fantastic amount of resources, um, amazing child therapist. Um, I was actually super glad when my kids aged out of her program so that her and I could be friends. It was great. Uh, but she is at Connecting Communities in Action. Uh, which is they have a Salamanca office, but they cover all of Cattaraugus County. They are a community action funded agency, which is a federal anti-poverty uh, initiative that started in, it's, I think it's about 60 years old now. I spoke at their 50th anniversary thing in Albany and it's been about 10 years. So about 60 years old, federally funded initiative to fight poverty. Um, and so on that note, in Jamestown, there is a community action agency called Chautauqua Opportunities. They are also a community action agency, but for the Chautauqua County area. <clears throat> and there is actually, this is a really important thing to know, in Jamestown, there is what's called a safe space. Safe space is an, an emergency shelter for youth. It's the only one. Yeah. General it's the only one in a massive radius. Um, I used to work at that place. There's so many times I slept on the floor overnight because someone didn't come in for their shift and there was no kids there and I just had to be there. I was like asleep under my desk. Um, but the safe space is identified by a yellow uh, sort of uh, like a, a square tipped on its side, right? Whatever that shape is. Again, I don't do math and shapes. I do words. <laughs> Rhombus? It's not quite a dime. Is it a diamond if it's still equal? Diamond? Okay. All right. It's diamond shaped sign. <laughs> right? Exactly. I'm like, can I get a third grade math teacher here, please? Uh, but so it is located next to the 7 Eleven in Jamestown. Um, there's like where Family Video used to be. There's a 7 Eleven across the road. There's a brick building with a sign that says safe space. That is a shelter that kids can go to at any point, at any time, without any questions asked. I mean, they'll ask you questions once you come in, because they'll set you up with a social worker and a case manager right away. But that is a really important thing to know because it's one of it is the only shelter for unaccompanied youth in a very, very drastically large radius. Um, so uh, if you look up safe place online, you can see the sign. Uh, I would just make sure you maybe have that sign uh, in kids brains in case they should need it. Is it appropriate to have that symbol like on an office door? Um, or something? Like, is there a symbol that we could like utilize I would to show that we're safe? Like 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would look at, um, I would point you to the Gay Alliance of Genesee Valley, uh, which I might, it might have rebranded at this moment, but you can still find it. They're out of Rochester and they do a safe zone training. I'm, okay. I'm actually a safe zone I trainer through that. them. I have that. You have that? Yeah, and they have sticker safe zone training is an actual program that you can take and it's just a like LGBTQ primer course. Yeah, Fun you story. Can just download it. Yeah, you can just download it. You don't have to do it in person now. Yeah, it's just a, it's a cute little circle. It just yep. yeah. safe zone. It gives you a little sticker that you can put on your door and also with the training that accompanies it, it guarantees you have a certain amount of competency to speak about it. Fun story, I was a, I was a safe zone trainer uh, and I did a safe zone training at, at um the YWCA in Bradford and my mom was on staff at the time in another department and at that point my mom was just like really not cool with me being gay and so I gave this safe space training that my mom was in. <laughs> good times. I love the jail, man. We are tight. It's good now. We, we worked on our, our relationship. But, um, but yeah, no, it was a really funny story. So yes, I would encourage something like that. That's actually a great, we're trying, we're fighting tooth and nail to get this initiated in Olean and they're just dragging their feet on a free training that qualifies for continuing education I can, credits. I can actually choose in the school as to my own horn to rob in our sector the other day. So on our Randolph's website, if you go to the guidance page, I have like a my bit